Greetings to all. My name is Carolyn Harshman, and I am the second vice president of the International Association of Emergency Managers, um, welcoming you today to our Disaster Cost Recovery and Finance Caucus's uh, webinar on the topic of COVID-19 cost recovery. We have a wonderful panel put together that our caucus chair, Mike Martinet, will be introducing in just a moment. Um, this particular caucus is one of many subject-specific caucuses, committees, and ad hocs that are maintained through the International Association of Emergency Managers. Um, just one, a couple of quick administrative notes. First of all, the way that you will submit questions to our panelists will be to use the chat capability of the webinar that's located in your sidebar about two-thirds of the way down. Um, also, this session is being recorded, as was the one on Monday and will be on Friday. All three of those recordings will be made available to um, any, not only our members, but also anyone interested. And those will be located once they're all done on our COVID landing page at IAM.com. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Martinet, who is the chair of the Disaster Cost Recovery and Finance Caucus. Take it away, Mike. Thank you, Ms. Carolyn, and welcome everybody. Uh, sorry that we're all going through this, but you know, it's the cards we're dealt. Uh, what I wanna do first is just a real brief uh, introduction. We have an excellent panel and um, uh, to take your questions, uh, we'll go over uh, the handouts. The handouts are available and uh, so Margaret Larson is a senior vice president with AG Wit. Uh, Margaret, uh, well, Margaret said, don't tell them how long I've been doing this. Um, but um, Margaret's currently with AG Wit. Uh, that's James Lee Wit, um, who started a new firm. Prior to that, she was with Ernst & Young doing disaster cost recovery work uh, relative to FEMA's public assistance. And um, she is a former FEMA employee and also worked in the private sector. Margaret, would you give us your top two or three uh, important bullet points uh, and, and what you're advising people uh, on how to, how to best deal with this COVID-19 and the cost recovery aspects? Hi, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's, I'm Margaret Larson. Like Mike said, I'm with um, AG Wit, Atlas Global Wit. And in the conversations that we have been having with clients, some of the re uh, repetitive themes include time tracking, what, how people are going about that, whether it's creating something in your time tracking HR system that allows you to code your time, but the essential, um, how essential it is for your reimbursements with FEMA to track your time and the labor rates, the fringe benefits that are going with that. So that's been a tremendous uh, effort for people to organize how they're tracking their time. The importance of insurance, if you, have an, if you happen to have an insurance policy that covers some of the, this, obviously there's some exclusions for, um, for a pandemic, but looking carefully at your insurance because you cannot duplicate benefits. FEMA will not pay for duplication of benefits. Donated resources, volunteers, that's another volunteers and their labor, the uh, equipment, their actual resources, all of that is something that's taking a monumental effort. And then the other thing is really identifying, although FEMA does not happen to reimburse at this time for, um, for lost revenue. Lost revenue is a tremendous area that people are putting a lot of focus on. It may help inform associations and others on how to articulate to Congress where the big gaps are in FEMA funding or other federal agencies. So with that, Mike, that's Thank my intro. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, the question box is open. Uh, I just have a couple of questions here. So if you have questions, uh, this would be the time while we're going through the panelists to uh, send me your questions. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to introduce Wendy Huff Ellard. Uh, Wendy is an attorney with Baker Donaldson and uh, has 13 years experience in disaster cost recovery issues uh, in the state of Mississippi, which is a great state uh, apparently to get ex disaster experience. And uh, with that, Wendy, your top two or three bullet points or, or 
what you're seeing people most concerned about these days? Absolutely, and and I agree that Mississippi is a great state for a lot of great reasons. But um, right now, you know, we're in an unprecedented situation. FEMA is issuing guidance on a rolling basis, including several fact sheets just yesterday, and we've been advised that those are going to to keep coming. So we're we're watching for that. We're also watching for additional guidance from the states that are particularly active and have great resource websites. And we're watching HHS. Um, I agree with Margaret that tracking those lost revenues is very, very important for entities that might be eligible under the HHS program because the CARES Act does specifically mention loss of revenue under the section that grants that big pot of funding. But for the FEMA funding, as of right now, because we don't have a lot of concrete guidance, we are encouraging people to really document any specific direction, any orders, including your state executive orders and your public health agency orders that requires you to do anything, that requires you to, to close your doors, that requires you to uh, you know, purchase the additional PPE, if you're a healthcare entity, anything from your, your uh, state health agency or your local health official telling you to do certain things because famous guidance keeps repeating this phrase at the direction or guidance of a public health official. And we haven't yet seen exactly what FEMA means by that. And um, another thing that we're telling people to watch is in your cost tracking to track any escalation of cost. You know, a lot of these things, especially again for healthcare entities, you may have been purchasing anyway, but now you're purchasing a lot more of them and definitely paying higher prices. And that that rings true for um, for your, your other entities in regards to overtime. You know, if you're paying your employees more, if you have a written policy that requires hazard pay, double time during an event like this, just make sure you track those things. And then finally, um, again, Margaret mentioned this too, with respect to duplication of benefits, the fact sheet that FEMA issued yesterday has some very specific language regarding what FEMA will and won't pay for, and also highlights again that FEMA will not pay for things that are covered by one of these other agencies, including specifically funds administered by HHS through the CDC. So there is going to be a lot of funding out there, a lot of resources, it's going to be very, very important to, uh, to know who is paying for what and to track everything correctly so that you can make the most out of all the resources out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. Mm -hmm. And uh, next, I want to go to John Shaw, who's a manager with Ernst & Young. Uh, John is in the insurance and federal claims practice at Ernst & Young. And prior to that, he was uh, with uh, Ale Alachua, I, I murdered that. Closer. <laughs> it was much closer, it was much closer. Okay, county in Florida, and prior to that, uh, with Jacksonville for a number of years. Um, John, your top two or three uh, most important things that, that if, if uh, Wendy and, and uh, Margaret have not checked in on those thanks. things yet. Yeah, thanks, Mike, appreciate it, and appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel. Uh, so the, the number one issue, and this actually relates to what Margaret and Wendy were both talking about with cost tracking, is the integration of your finance and admin functions into your ESG operations. And really, this way they can focus on making sure that your procurement is in compliance um, with the necessary rules and regulations that are available, and it's also being in compliance with exigent circumstances. You want to track your resources, uh, timekeeping, and really, finance admin is always the longest time component of a response operation. So it's really important to provide them all the data that they need to be able to do their job as well. This then leads into cost tracking. And we're all, we're all probably going to say this many times throughout the webinar of document, document, document. A big, big, big piece of the integration of finance admin into EOC operations is cost tracking. You want to make sure that if you haven't already, that you set up cost codes to track those costs. 
And examples may include the DOC activities, your call center activities, disinfections of facilities, um, specialized medical equipment, remote working or disruption to workplace costs, a number of items that have been provided guidance by FEMA and uh, continue to be provided guidance for. And then it also can be a little difficult in how are you going to be able to track these costs amid workplace absenteeism that may result as COVID continues to increase its uh, prevalence in our society and also amidst the social distancing. How are you able to do this when your employees are working from home? Are your policies adaptable to work from home or are there some changes that need to be made suddenly to be able to stay in compliance with your policies and make sure that your folks can get paid? Um, and then finally, a, a real big important piece of this is gonna be developing and implementing a recovery funding strategy because on the one hand, we're looking at this in the present time right now. Um, this is an active incident that's going to continue to happen. But when, and I just saw that Florida is issuing a state home order as well. So already, you know, as of yesterday, we had 80% of the country that was under a state home order and that continues to increase. So as a result of this, we're seeing a decrease in tax revenues. Uh, we're seeing a, um, an increased reliance on rainy day funds that uh, counties and cities would have in their, in their budgets. So how are, how are you planning to cover your costs amidst reduced tax revenues? Um, how are you planning to cover your costs when you're waiting for FEMA to reimburse you for those costs? Does your insurance policy cover these benefits as Margaret and Wendy both mentioned about duplication of benefits? And then finally, overall, just the question of what is your plan? This is something that's gonna be, a, it's gonna take a lot longer than just the next couple weeks or months. Uh, this is gonna take a long time. And what is your plan for being able to survive and sustain your organization through it and come out more resilient on the back end. Thank you, John. Um, it, it occurred to me while um, Margaret, Wendy, and John were speaking that this disaster is unique in so many ways. And one of the ways it's unique is that different agencies have very different focal points. So your medical and nonprofit hospitals they're looking at it from one way, especially with increased operating costs, uh, but not necessarily decreased revenues, but cities and counties uh, are looking big time at decreased revenues, as John referenced. Um, and um, then you've got water school districts and others that may have a combination of decreased revenue and increased operating costs. Uh, I know this is, is hard to believe, but none of you are out there alone. And I would suggest that you reach out to colleagues with other similar types of organizations, cities, counties, hospitals, special districts, and establish communication with those folks to see how they're doing it. Because uh, some people have got experience and, and some familiarity with this stuff. And uh, don't try to go alone. Uh, there, there is help available out there if it's only other people who are suffering the same as you are. With that, uh, I want to go to to the questions, and the first one uh, is uh, from Mark Demsky. Uh, question: Has is there any further decision on whether FEMA will cover the cost of emergency pro, uh, procurement subscription of incident management software such as VOC or WebEOC? uh he says the software would be rented basically during this event um any one of our panelists have you seen since monday any change in in fema's attitude on this i have not when do you seen anything john negative negative no i haven't mm -mm. all right so it sounds like uh at the moment it, it's it's still going to be iffy, uh, Mark. Uh, Tricia Campbell, what are the requirements of PN for PNPs to be eligible for Category B? Um, John, you want to take that one? Sure. So, um, uh, Tricia, thanks for the question. If you refer to the FEMA uh, program policy guide, the, the Papa G, the um, there's going to be specific requirements on what a PNP is 
And sometimes it may be that a PMP provides a critical function to a community. Um, Faith-based organizations may also qualify for PMP status. So it's something that uh, you would look at your own organization and um, compare that to what is written in the program policy guide to determine whether or not you may be eligible. And if you are eligible, then you may want to contact your, um, your local emergency management, your state emergency management to, um, to be able to complete your RPA or request for public assistance. So Margaret or, or uh, Wendy, anything to add to John's comment? Yeah, I, I, um, I do think that we may see a little bit more um, liberal interpretation of the usual policy restricting PMP entities from, from uh, applying for assistance for Cat B. I think in, in this event, you know, a lot of the costs are related and required to protect the public health and safety. And despite the fact that some of these entities may not technically be legally responsible for that in the same way that, you know, a city, county, or governmental entity is, of course, we don't want, you know, the, the private nonprofit hospital shutting down or rejecting people. I mean, I think if you ask them, they would say, yes, you know, we're responsible for the, the health and safety of the public. This is what we do. And, and I think here it's a lot more important that we all work together, um, you know, public and nonprofit to make sure that we get through this thing. And my hope is that FEMA will recognize that in the fact sheet that FEMA issued yesterday. Um, it does state, just as the PAPPG does, that uh, an entity has to be legally responsible for the work, but then it does go on to indicate that uh, PNPs that have eligible um, you know, healthcare related facilities and are providing those emergency services and to protect the health and safety of the public uh, can be eligible, may be eligible. So again, I think that's one of those situations where I would make sure to document any any orders, any discussions with your public health officials. Thanks. And my, yeah, and Michael, just add to that too. I know that, um, and you're, you've been involved in these discussions too, that the um, food banks have been directed to, um, to do essential services and feeding um, by certain governors. And obviously if there's a mission assignment, there's going to be a direct correlation to what they're doing, but making sure that if there's the ability to have an agreement with a city or a county on feeding services with that private nonprofit um, and helping them through it. But I know that the, that group in particular is looking at um, what it is that the language in, in the Stafford Act intends for them and how to go about getting reimbursement for them on an, as an eligible subrecipient. I think they're also using the argument that it's an essential government service, the feeding mission of this. Thank you, everybody. Um, and again, if you're not sure, and, and I've had a lot of discussions with PNPs in the last couple of weeks, um, they're out there free floating in, in inter intercellular space uh, right now. Uh, document, document, document. If you take on an order, be sure it's COVID related and, and ideally you're gonna have uh, some kind of an order either from, from a governor or a, a senior chief executive of a city or county. And you're gonna have a finding from the county health officer that if you don't do this, people are gonna get sick possibly die. Um, okay, any information on hazard pay? I'm not sure if uh, the policy was on the books before situation, but if it wasn't, would exigent circumstances surrounding this cover an increase of hazard pay for first responders? Um, Margaret, want to opine on this one? I think I'm going to have to pass on this one. Okay. Uh, uh, John or Wendy? Yeah, the, this is Wendy. The standard rule on hazard pay is that um, FEMA will look to your pre-event policy to see what your pre-event policy provides, what you would have paid without any federal assistance. Um, it should be pursuant to some kind of written standard. It can't be under the sole discretion 
of any official and it should not be based on declaration of a federal emergency. That's the standard rule and I have not seen anything expressly waiving or changing that for this event. And, and that's my observation too. Thanks, Wendy. Let's go to the next question. What is the best resource for local governments to get specifics on what costs are covered and mechanism to obtain those resources? Uh, and that's a great segue. I wanna jump for a second to the handouts. The handouts are available on the uh, website there. If you click that little arrow down toward the bottom, it says handouts one, you'll find uh, a packet there, 52 pages. Uh, I wanna go through that real quickly. Uh, first one is the announcement of the president uh, directing FEMA support on, for COVID-19. The next one is a two-pager on eligible protective measures. Uh, and uh, Wendy or Margaret, if something has superseded one of these, please let me know. Um, then uh, the fourth page is public assistance, non-congregate sheltering delegation of authority. This is big. In the past, if people were being moved from a congregate shelter, like in a gymnasium or an arena, to trend, what FEMA calls transitional housing, meaning they got a room, it's a hotel, a motel, trailer, whatever it is, FEMA in the past, only would allow themselves to arrange transitional housing. If a local agency did it, it was coming out of that local agency's pocket. FEMA has delegated this because you can't have these huge uh, things without some risk of, of transmission of COVID-19. So they're, <coughs> excuse me, allowing local agencies to, based on, on situation, not just everybody can do it but based on on the criticality of the situation being able to implement this so-called transitional housing and put people into uh, a single room uh, living setup um, the next page is uh, uh, seven is a letter dated march 17th for procurement under grants conducted under emergency or existing circumstances for covid 19 and then page late, two pages later is a FEMA fact sheet on procurement under grants under emergency circumstances. Then if you jump to page 15, that is extracted and the next several pages are extracted directly from what we call the Papa G or the Public Assistance Program and Policy Guide. And that's actually what the guide is you can go to fema.gov and download the papa g p a p p g and uh, get the entire manual uh, page 27 is the public assistance simplification for nationwide emergency declaration of covid 19 so this is a fema talking points worksheet that should provide you with some good information uh, and Let's see here. Uh, let me go. Okay, and then going to page uh, 39 is the public assistance applicant procurement compliance checklist. If you're purchasing stuff, I would highly recommend that you reference this checklist to make sure you're crossing your T's, you're dotting your I's, etc. Um, those are the handouts that are available. And as I get more uh, from various sources, or if other people send them to me, then I collate them and make them available. So that's what's in your handouts. And so uh, in regard to Mike Slater's question, what's the best resource uh, to get specifics on what costs are covered? This is as good as it gets right now, unless your FEMA region or your state has come out with something different. Uh, Next question uh, from Sean or Sean Harris Harrison. I hope I didn't murder that first name. Uh, is equipment purchased for employees to work from home during this event reimbursable? This would be an essential business position 
equipment may include laptop, tablets, uh, Wi-Fi units, printers, etc. cetera. Um, Margaret, please. This one falls into what is your existing policy for telecommuting and making sure that if you don't have something, document the decisions to purchase. Um, I know that uh, universities and institutions of higher education as well as schools are documenting their costs to transition to online um, online classwork and working through the, um, the eligibility of that. So I would keep very close documents of this and start with what your existing policy is as to why the purchases are made, who's getting it and how they're using it and how you're tracking the use and proper use of the equipment because it, it may be something that, um, that FEMA will ultimately reimburse. Yeah, but it's not a dead bang at this moment. It's not a dead, that's right. That's exactly right. Uh, Wendy or John, any any other? I, I wanted to echo what Margaret said and, and really highlight the importance of those contemporaneous memos or memos to file of why you did things. Because something like this, you know, it, it may be, if it's allowable, it may be a big help for you in the future. Um, but why did you do it and how does this how is it supported by your existing policies or not supported and how the decisions can be made is very important. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, just one more small thing. I, I fully expect FEMA to issue a guidance document on educational institutions because I know they all are incurring additional costs for hardware, software, IT support for distance learning and, um, and also additional costs for meals. So that, that's one recommendation, watch for that. But then two, for those entities that are not educational institutions, I think it's gonna be really important to document what those individuals are doing. Um, the, the question I think referenced an essential employee, if you've got a, you know, a police dispatcher working from home and using a laptop and internet and, and phone and switchboard in their living room, I think it would be pretty clear that, you know, FEMA would pay for that versus some, you know, other types of service that could be a little more uh, on the line. So documentation key for sure. Absolutely. If it's something that really supports the incident, then that definitely helps. It's not a yes, but it helps. And okay. Mike, I... Mike, it's Margaret. If I may um, just put in the pitch for um, IAM and how effective they are in articulating, rolling up um, issues of utmost concern to local emergency managers to Congress. So as an appropriations bill is needed, um, as new appropriations may be needed, and what is included and discussions on a policy level with FEMA, IAM is such a great organization for doing that. So I just want to make that pitch on their behalf. Thank you, Margaret. And and I would, if you're an IAEM member, I would run that through to your IAEM regional president uh, so that headquarters is not inundated with uh, uh, all these requests. Um, Jennifer uh, Madewell asks, uh, where would you submit a claim for loss of revenue? Um, Wendy, please. I'm gonna well, let you- FEMA, FEMA's not going to pay for that. So I'll start with that, but there is language in the CARES Act that indicates that the funding being provided to HHS, Health and Human Services, may be available to cover lost revenues, but um, we're watching those programs like I'm sure all of you are, and the fact is that they're just so early in the developmental stages that we don't really know exactly what they're going to pay for or what the process is going to look like. So that's another issue that I'd, I'd keep my eye on it and track, track your losses so that whenever the program opens, if you are eligible, you're ready to go. Yeah, uh, they don't pay for lost revenue normally and we'll see where it goes with COVID. Uh, Paul Harris asks, is there likely to be scope to recover salary and benefit costs for exempt employees that are working inside or outside of the EOC or on COVID emergency related tasks and therefore unable to work on normal duties? Uh, Margaret? If they're working on duties outside of their regular position is that how i understand this question to read uh i i believe that's how it, 
Yeah. So if they're doing emergency functions outside of their regular job, there's, you're still going to have to, if you're an exempt employee, your 40 hours are, are what you would normally work. But anything outside of that and that it goes towards increased hours outside of your regular 40 hours a week or, or whatever that may be, um, you should definitely be tracking it towards the towards disaster costs. The other thing is that those doll, those hours can go towards, there's a calculation that goes towards those hours that might be part of your um, your non-federal cost share. Yeah, so it's worth uh, tracking that time in in case. It Absolutely. Goes. Yeah, it's, it definitely falls into the category of um, needs to be tracked. Yeah. John, Wendy, anything to add? Okay. Um, John, go ahead. I was just going to say echo echo what Margaret said, document everything. Okay. Uh, Joseph Ramos asks, what are procurement, oh, excuse me, what are reimbursements prorate amounts for emergency items purchased, such as for communication equipment for employees working at home, equipment may be used after the COVID pandemic? I think that kind of goes to that earlier question uh, about buying computers um, and uh, other electronic equipment so people can work at home and social distance. Um, okay, let's see what we got here. Okay, now I'm not sure what this means. This is from uh, Valdemar uh, Fonseca. How about a cost increase in both overtime and dumping fees? Uh, associated with more bulky waste pickups that now are now escalated because residents are self-quarantining, working remotely from home? That's a good question. Anybody want to take a shot at that? Ah, uh, that, that's a really interesting question. That's one that I haven't seen come up and I haven't thought of. Um, I believe FEMA would likely see the increased uh, waste management type charges as ineligible increased operating expenses, I think. I that, think. Would be, that would be my opinion. And uh, Mike, does, does this go into as well the question that came up on Monday's call about um, the sanitation districts and having to do additional work um, for maintenance of their equipment? It, it, it's probably related. It's probably okay. related. I can't mm -hmm. say for sure. I yeah, I do. And I do agree with Wendy's answer. Yeah. Okay. Tricia Chappelle, can you please clarify what you said about activities need to be requested, authorized by a local health official? Um, let me start that and then any one of our panelists can jump in. The county health official is a mighty important official right now, or your state health official. Um, they can order certain things done, and if they order it, FEMA is not real likely to fight it because they're not health officials. They will recognize. That said, don't let your deputy health inspector or health official sign the order. It must be signed generally by the, the the health official, unless that person has COVID-19 uh, and can't sign it. And any of the panelists wanna add clarification to that? Okay. Um, okay, uh, here's a good one. Any chance IEM can set up a chat board for members to help connect and discuss further? So I'll, I'll bounce that back to Chelsea, and, and Chelsea, you can, we can talk about that. Uh, here's, uh, I think my friend Paul Johnson, I know he's my friend, I don't know if it's that same Paul Johnson. Does public health need to issue a directive, approval, or just acknowledge an expenditure by a potential applicant? Uh, Margaret, please. Okay, so the question is whether or not the public health department needs to actually issue the directive? Yes. 
you do want to get an actual directive. It's what we were saying earlier about having um, it signed by the director, unless they have had to delegate authority to someone else, you are gonna wanna have that directed directive from public health um, and have it in writing so that you can formally document why you did that activity, especially if it's something that FEMA may not recognize as um, something that is being conducted on behalf of county public health or a, t a traditional FEMA activity, you'll wanna have that in writing. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, Brevin Mettler, um, one of our colleagues from California, how will we be reimbursed for backfill overtime for people that are working in the EOC or a DOC? John, you take a shot at that or one of you? Maybe their mics are off. You, sorry, if you have, mine was that time. If you have transferred staff to eligible functions, then the general rule is that cost incurred to backfill those employees can be eligible. All right, but the rules just... on payment of staff time vary widely based on what the person is doing, whether it's regular time or overtime, whether they were within your budget, um, and what you are directed to pay them according to your pre-event written policy. So those are going to be very fact-specific questions. It's covered in the PAPPG, and if my memory serves me correctly, I think there's a little chart that FEMA often cites. Okay. Yep. I think I think you're right, Wendy. And then the other thing to add to this is that if you have employees who are funded by another federal grant and they're not able to do that job, but they're doing something related to the disaster, communicating the use of their time to the granting agency um, in advance is always a prudent thing to do, but also to formally track how they are working. Again, it goes back to time tracking in general, but just showing that they're doing something that's non-related to their regular job. And especially with grants, um, that differentiation is gonna be important. So it does not look like a duplication of benefits. Yeah, good point, Margaret. If, if I was on a CDBG funded grant, let's say for graffiti abatement, and that's all I did for 40 hours a week with, with another employee, and now we're not doing that, but we've been work, uh, assigned work on, on COVID related stuff. Our straight time is eligible because we were on a grant funded program. So you have to know uh, if it was a grant funded program and uh, if that straight time might be available. Um, okay, uh, Lloyd Blanchard, uh, to what extent are lost revenues rebates eligible? I work at a university and we sent students in our dorms home and rebated the balance of their fees as a result of the pandemic. Lost revenue. John? This is what... Go ahead, John. I was just gonna say that lost revenue, you know, we, we've been talking about that, that FEMA doesn't cover lost revenues. Uh, there are, there's um, note about it in the CARES Act about potential, um, methods for recouping lost revenues, but uh, it's really too early, too soon to figure out how it's gonna work and what it's gonna cover. Um, Wendy or Margaret, did you have anything else or mouthy? Mm-hmm, no, nope, agree. No, I have, I have seen that some of the um, associations representing higher education circulating their next pitch on that to what the pro the next appropriations emergency appropriations act might include for them to and i believe it includes the um looking for some avenues to help with some of the lost revenues but it is not currently eligible okay and uh, paul johnson again is asking in the past we received reimbursement for administrative time under category z uh, and this is Cat Z is, is money that's normally paid to the state. Um, and some states share it and some states don't. So in the past, we've received reimbursement for admin time under Cat Z. Will this take place with COVID-19? Uh, anybody have a crystal ball out there? Yeah, I, I, uh, I have not seen FEMA issue any specific guidance with respect to this event, but 
that means I have also not seen FEMA issue anything stating that its standard policy for payment of management costs will not apply to this event. And the applicable policy right now would be the, uh, the interim policy that provides that you will, applicants and states, get management costs based on a percentage and that you can use those funds for direct and indirect costs. You have to document your actual costs and show that you, know, you followed proper procurement and your costs were reasonable and, and all the usual things. Um, but yes, I, I do think that for, for DRs, which right now I think we've got 29, so it's looking like every state will probably eventually have one, um, major disasters. I do think we're going to see management costs funded. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks, uh, Ben. And, and, and I wanted to add, uh, I wanted to add real quick on the, the intermediate cost policy. So there's there's limited guidance available on that, and uh, for everyone on the call, you you want to look for both the intermediate cost policy as it relates to public assistance, and then also look for the intermediate cost policy SOP. Uh, those two guidance documents right there are really what's available right now for how to proceed. With, uh, with documenting and tracking those costs and um, until we have an update of the Papa G. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, Benny Wolford asks, can you expand on the cost that may be incurred for a publicly funded school district? Um, anybody wanna take a shot at that? Okay. Well uh for for a publicly funded i'm assuming you mean a public public school um you know own, owned and run by the state i i do think there will be some costs that they're eligible for i think that fema again is going to have to issue some kind of educational um applicant fact sheet because i know the schools are incurring a lot of costs i think they're probably um in the top three categories of applicants that we're going to have for this event, you know, being local government, uh, schools, and healthcare, uh, healthcare entities. Um, so I would, I would document that. I would do just what we've been telling um, everyone on this call to document any orders from your public health uh, entities, any orders from your state uh, board of education, you know, when you're ordered to close, if you're ordered, to provide those distance learning programs. I think some states have been a little more forceful than others regarding what you have to do, um, the meals that you're providing. Um, I've, I've heard talk of delivery of meals, if you're incurring extra costs to actually take the meals to different places, things like that. And then I think it was uh, Margaret that mentioned um, donated resources as a credit to your cost share. People love to donate things to schools. So absolutely donate, I mean donate, document any donations that you are getting because when you are eligible to apply for those public assistance dollars, you're gonna get hit by a non-federal cost share and then you can use your donations as a credit against that. And Mike, I wanna add something if I may really quickly on, on the donations. If you, for example, let's say you have a community foundation or another that's um, helping to fundraise and donate large dollars to an entity to help with response and recovery or whatever it may be, be sure to document that and or apply it in a way that is not going to show up as a duplication of FEMA benefits so that you can use it in, for something that maybe FEMA is it's a gap in FEMA funding. So, um, so if you know that it's something that the community is going to need and you're prioritizing it, compare it to FEMA eligible categories and or other federal agencies to be sure that you're not going to miss out on uh, full access to the FEMA dollars. Very good, Margaret. I, now, now this next question from Elizabeth Wagner, I, Elizabeth, I'm going to have to send you a $20 bill to thank you for asking this question. Is it possible to find out who the FEMA subject matter experts assigned to the region, state, et cetera, regarding eligible cost reimbursement is? Elizabeth, you're listening to them. Um, and, and, and there are many others, people who are, who are well qualified. 
Uh, I'm not aware that FEMA has a position of SME, subject matter expert, uh, who's assigned them. And all the FEMA people know, but um, they don't have that particular title. And Margaret, uh, John or Wendy, want to weigh in on that as well? Yeah, I've never seen a list, even when I worked at FEMA, of that. Um, and and for you know anybody who's looking for assistance, I know that a lot of cities, counties, schools, and so forth, eligible subrecipients have hired and brought in people to advise them. So talk to your friends, um, talk to your colleagues that you respect and ask around to validate um, and find those that may be, um, may be able to help out as well. Yeah. It's a good word of mouth uh, community. Very good. Um, Christy Crosser, uh, FEMA, the CARE Act, HHS funding, what other funding resources might be available? Is there anything else that, that our panelists know of other than what I've mentioned, FEMA, the CARE Act, and HHS funding? I don't know right now of any other grant. Um, I suspect that the Department of Education may release funding um, you know, after some of the big events in the past, including Hurricane Katrina, there were additional grants to pay for um, relocation of students and, uh, you know, restart of operations. One of the big programs was called Restart. Um, so I, I think it's, it's very possible as we see what the needs are, what the uncompensated needs are for different entities that we'll see additional programs and then there are um, there are several different loan programs you know the SBA has several different programs out now um, that were just expanded with the CARES Act uh, RUS the uh, Rural Utility Service uh, has a loan program that I think was also expanded in the CARES Act um, I'm sure there are others uh, one that I know of is the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, in speaking mm -hmm. with Patrick Crawford um, over the weekend, um, the food banks uh, and, and, uh, and USDA, if, if they're contributing food, then that's not going to be paid for by FEMA because that would be a duplication of benefits. So uh, if you are getting funding from another source, you need to be aware that it, it could be an offset against FEMA, but take it because if, if USDA or some other federal agency will pay for it, FEMA will not. So you've got to track it. Uh, and Mike, it, on on SNAP, uh, the USDA program, um, formerly known as food stamps, but the supplemental nutritional assistance programs, there is a DSNAP program, D being disaster, and there's actually a, a, um, a higher rate of reimbursement to localities that are receiving those funds if you have a DSNAP plan in place. So it may be too late to quote, create a plan, but it's certainly something that you want to, um, that you will need to ask that question because it can help with a higher level of reimbursement. And, and Mike, I also wanted to add, uh, just for everyone on the call, that the White House Office of Intergovernmental Affairs has been conducting, I believe there are weekly briefings for state and local elected officials. I believe I am actually passed this out to its members. Um, so this, these calls, they, they have a lot of information regarding programs that are being uh, implemented for locals and states to be able to, um, to manage their incident response. So that may be a source of information for folks. The most recent call was actually a couple hours ago. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Mike, has anybody heard if there are discussions along the lines of additional programs, but um, especially because of the homeless population issues and safely quarantining um, and social distancing with large large cities, large counties in particular on homeless populations, but any discussions about CDBG disaster recovery? I have just not heard anything specific yet. That is one acronym I've not heard bandied about in, in this response at all is the Community Development Block Grant Program. Doesn't mean it's not out there, just means I have, haven't heard of it. 
I mean, uh, I have an age or... mm -mm. Okay. Uh, Paul Johnson, again, uh, does non-congregate sheltering have to be approved by a FEMA regional administrator? Uh, if you look at page four, that's the release uh, fact sheet from March 19th. Uh, and bullet number one on that says non-congregate sheltering must be at the direction of and documented through an official order signed by state, local, or tribal territorial health public official. So it sounds like it does not have to be approved prior to doing it, but I would read that uh, two, three page handout uh, on non-congregate sheltering uh, carefully before uh, signing somebody into a hotel. Um, uh, Tricia Chappelle, ask which version of the FEMA of Papa G? A great question, uh, Tricia. Uh, it is the one from 2018. My last understanding was that the draft that was supposed to take effect January 1 of this year is still in draft. Uh, Wendy or Margaret, uh, John, any of you know differently? Yeah, there was a comment period out for several uh months it seemed and i suspect that fema got a good many comments to it and i suspect even if it was close to publication now that fema is probably pulling it back to possibly add some content to address some of the current issues so that we're not in one of those 2017 18 situations where we've got three versions within about six months yeah um so i, I agree with you right now it's it's the 2018 version yes Okay. And Carla, I was in a meeting before really nobody could travel in California with Carlos Castillo and what Wendy just said is reflects what he was saying. Okay, good. And Carlos Castillo is a, is a high ranking FEMA official. If, if Carlos says it's blue, it's blue. Uh, or if it's red, it's red. Okay, Javier Valdez. If a city government supports the business community, such as restaurants, in reimbursing scheduled revenue loss, can city government recover that cost through FEMA or any other program? Um, I'll throw that out there. I don't think so, but maybe one of you can make a, a more intelligent sounding answer. I don't think so either under our current program. Okay. I agree, and it actually opens up a bigger question that I've gotten quite a few questions on from um, other other lawyers, Wendy, who don't typically do this kind of work. But the question is about how to, how to go about applying for small business administration loans, and mm -hmm. and the and the need for that. And so there seems to be from and I've had a lot of client calls about my my sister her business is closing it's a small business dot 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 and who advises on the small business side of the house um i know that each like california has a really good um they have an office that works specifically with businesses but just some does anybody have a recommendation on how to help and where where are the best resources for small for businesses in general but small businesses in particular that are so at risk i don't know if anybody has something to offer there no, I, I don't. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Uh, uh, and another one from Tricia. Uh, for those states that close schools, will the purchase of equipment for students, laptops, tablets, et cetera, for distance or virtual learning be reimbursable? Uh, yeah, it's a question mark, I think. Um, Margaret, Wendy, John? Still a question mark. You are correct. Yeah, yep. yep. question mark. I, I think it falls under one of the earlier questions, though. I think we're going to see a fact sheet. I would document it, and I would document any public order to close and to continue the distance learning. Okay, here's a little different one. Here's from Mark Bennett. Um, he says, uh, FYI, during the North Carolina, I'm assuming the NC brief, FEMA briefing, they stated that FEMA public assistance may use non-competitive procurement 
under emergency or exigent circumstances for COVID-19 for critical needs of life, safety, and public health. Uh, this says IE mm -hmm. Kent based equipment sheltering. Do you still need to follow local policies and procedures? Um, I'm not quite sure. Maybe we'll have to talk Mike. offline, Margaret. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, we, we are advising people to make sure that you are documenting those decisions, how you made them, why you made them, and to make sure that you remain compliant with your um, with your own procurement policies. Um, we're calling it, just to be safe, a current relaxation of that FEMA requirement. And there are a couple of me memos from FEMA on relaxation of these rules during the emergency and exigency period. So FEMA has provided those to, um, they've made those public. And so, you know, really making sure though that you take into account that um, 2 CFR is going to come into play or it's going to be very important for compliance, but document how and why you're making the decisions. And again, that would include what Wendy said a couple of times about what kind of emergency directives and proclamations do you have that show that you're currently operating in, the, in this capacity. Okay. And, and one other quick thing on that too, because it's so important. I think procurement is just a huge issue and it's really easy to get it wrong. Um, even the EE waiver that FEMA's issued, which is on FEMA's website, um, confirms that it's it's not a, a wide open door waiver. There are things that you have to do. You still have to include all of the required federal terms and provisions in your contract. You still have to do a cost or price analysis. You still cannot do cost plus percentage of cost pricing and um, you have to document your justification. And then in regards to any local or state procurement policies, you do still have to comply with those. I think that's one reason we're seeing a lot of these um, state and local government emergency declarations because those allow a waiver of the state and local procurement rules. But um, we've been telling people to also check your internal policies because there have been a couple of instances, especially recently, where um, FEMA or the OIG has determined that the applicant complied with the federal requirements but violated their own policy, and um, they've actually gotten hit with the obligations because of that. So you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah, absolutely not. Okay, I think we've got time for one more quick question. And, and by the way, we got through less than half of the questions today. So thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Uh, we are compiling all the questions and and we're going to look at the at the duplications and then see which ones uh, we might answer and, and put up on the website. I want to take this last one uh, from Lisa Buchanan. Uh, how does the non-federal cost share work? Let me tell you how I understand it. And then Wendy, Margaret or John, if you've got other information, basically you've got a disaster, million dollar disaster, FEMA's paying for 750,000, your state's gonna pay for some portion or maybe none, depending what state you live in. And so you've got a 25%, let's say, uh, non-federal cost share. Uh, you already spent the money because you bought a bunch of supplies and stuff. Uh, what happens is down the road, um, you'll get a project worksheet documenting your donations of equipment, labor and, and supplies and stuff and uh, somebody at FEMA will approve that project worksheet. And then at some point down the road, uh, they send you a check because you already spent the money. Uh, Wendy or Margaret, John, can you amplify or correct that as needed? I think you covered it. Okay. Good job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I show one minute of uh, Miss Carolyn. Uh, how are we doing? Yes, on I'm here. Yeah, we're doing fine. You um, can make some wrap up comments if anybody has anything left to date to left to say. All right. Um, let's start. Uh, Margaret, uh, quick one, one most important closing comment. 
I think the questions um, definitely indicate how important it is to document your decisions so that if there are any, and as there are so many unknown answers yet, the documentation of how you've done this, your existing policies and so forth is essential. Thank you. Wendy? I agree. Document everything that you're doing. And um, I can't remember now who said it, but uh, keep in touch with your colleagues. Keep in touch with associations like IAEM because FEMA is going to continue issuing guidance. And um, even though the, the guidance is going to be helpful, like everything else, how FEMA implements it is going to be absolutely crucial. So um, keep keep learning from your from your friends and neighbors. And a good point, Wendy. And when I do training, I tell people right out the door, um, anything I say today can be wrong tomorrow because uh, this is a very much uh, a disaster in motion and FEMA seems to be continually uh, refining and, and expanding and relaxing policies. So if you've got documentation, you can deal with whatever or wherever FEMA policy lands. John? Uh, so that would be, I'm going to say it's going to be the third uh, document, the document, document, document for sure. And, and also a lot of the questions dealt with procurement and I would just caution you against just buying things because this is, you do this as an opportunity to get those things you, you might have really wanted. Um, be careful with, with your procurement, make sure that you're doing it under the, uh, the proper rules and regulations. And that includes your own as I believe Wendy was just saying a moment ago. So. So this is Carolyn and wrapping up on behalf of the International Association of Emergency Managers. I thank all of our attendees, all of our panelists. Uh, we will be offering another seminar later on in the week. Um, the recordings will be posted on the website as you see on the screen. Um, stay safe and thank you so much for your participation today. Bye-bye.